Well, welcome to another American TESOL Presents Free Friday Webinars. On today, we're going to talk about one of my favorite um, topics, which is play. Um, I think play is really important, and it's a great way for our learners to really dive into anything that we are teaching. Um, we can actually have our learners really grasp it um, through play. So that's what I wanted to, um, to do this webinar based on. Um, you can see us every Friday. It's free, so you can tell a friend. You can get a certificate uh, from American TESOL. And we always have different types of resources we share. We share all the bookmarks. And you also get to uh, keep the slides, so it's a great opportunity. <laughs> um, but we're, one of the reasons I picked play was because it's now towards the summer, and many different types of uh, schools and many teachers are getting to work in the summer with kids through camps. Or, and you might have a learning camp that you sometimes participate in for your children. Um, I know for me, it was kind of difficult when I first started planning what kind of activities, but I knew that I wanted them to play a lot because when students when uh, kids and, and teens are forced to learn in the summer the kind of learning that they think is not that great um, then they tend to be highly demotivated and um, I didn't want to run into a situation of working with many many teens that were just always in a bad mood so play really just aid with that type of um, emotion, you can really get your students to start coming out of their shells. And the other really great thing that happened today was this topic was decided probably a month ago. But today, our opening plenary was Dean Shararsky, and he talked about joy, this concept of joy, and how we can put joy into our teaching. And for me, it really um, kind of resonated and was sort of the equal as play because we find enjoyment in play. We, we happen to enjoy ourselves very much. We, there's a lot of joy associated with play. And you'll notice how I said us. And play as it is, is actually pedagogically sound. Um, some of the geniuses in our world, the ones that we all know and love, um, and even the best inventions, all of that was through play. So our best ideas come when we are allowed to have play. But not just play, free play. And I think that free play is like the most optimal type of play there is. Uh, I'll show you the difference later. But the difference really for now is you, a free play is when you aren't interrupted in the middle of your play. So if you can, for example, um, and I'll show you the next picture. Um, but, but when you think about when you play, and I want you to think back and to go back even further, uh, further than the eight years old, and even maybe four, and really look at what they do um, or how they play. And one of the things that you'll notice is that a lot of times, they're left and allowed to play. But when we get older, we turn to tone that down. We get very uncomfortable sometimes even playing. But what I think play is one of the most important ways we can learn is because right now in schools, you see a lot of emphasis on different types of tests. And this is what our students are doing most of the time. And if you're learning any type of topic or subject, even writing, this isn't a great way to learn. Um, it, it, it's not brain friendly. Um, the Gotsky, and um, I'll show you in a little bit of slide from PJ, support that that's not the best type of learning. Um, and one of the reasons why is because when you think of a test, it only has one possibility. But when you play, there are numerous possibilities. And you know, I think that's what ends up happening with play, is, is a lot of times in play, 
we also have our imagination. And with our imagination, we're able to think of many different types of scenarios and situations. And we're able to react in different ways. So we get to learn a lot about ourselves. And the other reason why I have play as this topic is because I was at the BAMIs, not this year, but last year. And I ended up talking to this expert named Nancy Kerrigan. And she was telling me that now there are first graders or, or students that are, um, I don't know, um, in, in that they're taking away recess, that a lot of schools now are are taking that instruction, um, the recess time, and making it to study more for tests. And that this is as young as the first grade, which is about six or seven years old. And that worries me, because that definitely shows how we undermine play, where we don't really see its value. But according to Piaget, when you think back at that, Think back at a two or three year old, and they're in the sand, and they're playing in the sand, and they're not interrupted. Well, and this is what um, Piaget says that when you're when you're that age, there's a lot of things that you can do. First of all, you have your imagination spark. There's a lot of experimentation, and that's one of the aspects of play. When you play, you have trial and error, and, and you have the ability to really have the error because it, during play, you realize it's not really money, money, money. Um, or, you know, when you play a board game or something like that, you just are able to kind of let um, your mind go, and you're able to test yourself in a way as well. So if you imagine your students, and, and think about that for your classroom. So we're going to talk about playgrounds now. Because part of play is playgrounds. And when you think about playgrounds, how can we make our learning and how can we make our classroom be like a playground? And I'm going to give you practical tips that teachers have been doing for a while and that are really successful. At least they have been very successful with me. Um, versus, you know, um, so the conversation we're having is how play is really important in the highest form of learning because we just had two new. So imagine this little girl and what is what are some of the things that she's doing right now? In the Sam. Well, and, and think of adults as well. Well, one thing is this, you can definitely tell during that, and in my, my argument would be actually that we learn best and we learn the most when we are young because that's when we'll take the opportunity to play and we don't even mind if we dirty our clothes. The other thing is that we, in, we test different boundaries. For example, when you're looking at, um, you know, there's so much, wonder and awe. And that was actually something that Dean was talking about today. He was saying how that has to be part of your curriculum. That every time your students leave the class, they should have a question. They should be wanting to be curious and learn more. And having playgrounds, um, a lot of times we associate this with young learners or with kids. But in fact, we continue the tradition of play, and play has different meanings for us. Because when you think of the different stages of development in play, and that's important to know, because when you're working with your learner, you want to see what is the optimal play. What is it going to be that's going to help them really grasp whatever you're trying to teach them? And I think that's very important because when you can distinguish it, then you can really design lessons that really meet those different types of needs. So, for example, um, a lot of times in men, you know, um, every all of us, we have our playgrounds that we go to. And a lot of times we go to them twice a week, three times a week. And what is a playground? A playground is an area where we get to play. It's an area where we have 
unlimited amount of uh, equipment of whatever it is. Okay, so we have, like in a playground, you have slides, you have swings, you have a sandbox. The possibilities are numerous, okay? What else constitutes a playground? Well, you have to be able to play. And what that means, play is in essence experimentation. It's you trying different things, and whether it be with a peer or whether it be with um, yourself, in the process of that trial and error, you're learning a lot of things. And a, a lot of times people will say, and teachers will, will correct that, and they'll tell me, well, that's failure. And we should teach failure, and that failure is not so bad. And I prefer trial and error because I think that's more what we do. Um, and, and if you make an error, it's not necessarily a failure. It's not something that's bad because then you discover or get new ideas from that. At least I do my best learning when, um, when my thinking is questioned. So what is your playground? So now that I've told you, it has to be somewhere where you can experiment, where you can have equipment, where you're left to be free to do what you want to do. So for many people, that's the gym. You see men go in the gym sometimes, and, and they'll do different types of weights. And a lot of times you'll see, if you look at, um, at the faces, you'll see that a lot of times they're confused. They're like, I want to go there, I want to go there, um, if they're working out or lifting weights. So a gym is one of our playgrounds as adults, and we have many different types of playgrounds as adults. Your kitchen. You get to do a lot of experimentation now. If you're really into cooking, then you try different things. You really challenge yourself when you play in your playground. And for many of us, we have to have that. If we didn't have it, then we would probably go insane. <laughs> and I think one of the best things about play, so Nancy Kerrigan, she wrote a book about this, and I'll have to update that later. Um, but she brought up very important things. When we take away play from kids, we actually hurt their development. Because during play, is when students aren't afraid to be themselves. They're not afraid to take risks. And they're not afraid to um, really step out of the box. And I think that's because it just comes out with the spirit of play. So if you're getting your students to, to have the ability to experiment, to trial and error, uh, where you don't even leave them, and, and, and in the type of play that is really optimal, um, every once in a while, and I'm not saying that this is something you should do, but every once in a while we need to get them to reach that point of play. The optimal type of play is when they're allowed to be loose, they're not going to get um, in trouble, um, and, and they're able to feel a little bit more comfortable. So play, like I said, um, many of the great um, scientists, philosophers we had all over the world um, mark play as one of the, the best ways that we can learn. And I want to show you a few examples of what this translates to because I really began to think about that and I thought, well, why is Einstein saying that? Why is he saying that play is research? And so I started learning um, a little bit more of what, I started reflecting what happens when we do play. And so I put some of this, um, there's the experimentation, you can be creative. Sometimes you collaborate. In other words, sometimes someone comes and they sit next to you in your sandbox um, or pillow area. <laughs> So, I mean, you can have critical thinking as well because you're always trying to test things and you're always trying to see if something works. Um, and then there's also that exploration. So this is what it looks like in my classroom. So now when I have my learning, I try to, ma I, I try to incorporate the elements of play. And we've talked about that, the freedom to be able to, uh, so there's times when they need to have free play and it's over a long period of time to accomplish a task, okay? Something like genius hour, um, that is, that's, you could incorporate play into that. 
um, things, and I'll show you some other too, but here I'm working with a lot of adults and they're still doing um, modeling what I, I showed her. So I think that play, when you have it with your students, you also develop this kind of relationship. And so how do we translate play with things we have? Well, here's another way. You saw those other ways that I was doing play before. But this is one way that I've done it with technology. Because I'm not a person who doesn't, I, I don't like when the technology is not better learning. I think if we're going to have technology, then we need to be able to support people. Um, and, and so a digital sandbox encourages exploration, it encourages curiosity, and encourages also um, ed camp. <laughs> and this is what my digital playground looks like. I use Symbaloo. I think Symbaloo is uh, really great for this a type of um, playground. And I started learning about digital playgrounds um, by Carol uh, Reed. And, um, but the symbol, when you look at uh, the different icons, you can click on it and you'll be led to that, um, to the resource. But you don't um, <laughs> uh, blame me. <laughs> So here, I'm going to go ahead and put this. It's called bit.ly.sandbox, and you can see, but you could do this for anything. So imagine that you were trying um, to get your students to learn the features of a car. I mean, there's so, so many ways we can bring our learning into re the real world where they can make connections, and it's a bit more meaningful to them. And so we're almost done. But this is the way it looks like as well. So when I started teaching with mobile devices and mobile learning, I've kept that tradition. I've kept the tradition of not going overboard. And um, I think that that's one of the worst things that has resulted of us not um, insisting our our kids close the door and stuff. I mean, I think it's just like. <laughs> um, but you can see here my students, my students are playing with their devices. They're actually making a movie right now. And when you think of play, they're able to experiment. They're in essence playing with each other. Look, I never told them they had to move. I never told them even get out of your seats, really. They just went and they decided they were going to make the, the best movies that they could within a lot of time. And this is all um, within a 45-minute lesson. And I think they did um, a fantastic job. And this is also play. So they're doing the same activity here, but they chose to sit, but they have a toy car. So it's, it's kind of funny because when we think about it, um, play just follows us throughout our lives. Um, and we all play differently. And Nancy Kerrigan pointed that out in her book. And, I, and, and one of the things that I, it made me really think about is when you play with others, those are important developmental skills. So if you work with learners 8 to 12, it's important that we take maybe even once a week, maybe twice a week, where we can take an allotted 30 minutes or something, uh, maybe even 10 minutes, um, but where we allow our students to just, participate in, in, you know, like in critical thinking and, um, but we leave them at it. We just say here, you're going to do what you want to do, but not in a negative way. You know, they have to tell us, and that's what Genius Hour is about too. Genius Hour incorporates play because it says at 20% you can do whatever you want. You can play any way that you want to play. So what does this look like um, in different scenarios? So I, I showed you one scenario, how I get my students to move with their devices, how they take pictures, they take movies. Um, and now here's another way, and one that teachers have been doing for a long time, which is learning stations. And the reason why I call learning stations good playgrounds for, for, um, for your classroom is because your classroom 
you can make it very interesting for kids. And you can decide whether or not to monitor um, the learning station. So what that means is you can either take a participation grade, a grade. I ended up having to, um, and, and that's one of the aspects of play too, is, is grades aren't really part of that. So I think that if you take one day out of the week, or a part of the curriculum and dedicated to that, and the kids know that they're not going to um, fail, then then that's a good thing. Um, because when we think about the young kid, um, the toddler, and he's playing in the sand, one of the wonderful things about that is even though he is so little, and even though um, we have our toddlers um, and four, we actually give them the most freedom. We, we don't interrupt their play. But as we get older, we're constantly interrupting our play. And we're constantly interrupting the play of others. And it comes to a point where sometimes we forget how to play. And we even forget how to play well with others. And um, Kerrigan, Nancy Kerrigan, um, she writes that in her book. She says how when students are together, they figure it out. They figure out um, what's acceptable in the playground. They've already figured it out. They figure out who's the king of the playground. And they go through all these kind of rituals and these interactions. And those are really important as well for language learning. It's really important that, uh, and even communication. Because nonverbal is such an important part, but so is negotiation. Um, and when our kids are growing up, they really do need those opportunities to be able to interact and, and, and really um, play with others so they can learn how to play well with each other. And I wanted to show you this picture because not only um, learning stations, but we also have labs. And labs are one of the most sophisticated ways we play. Um, and through playing, and, and what I mean by playing is you are allowed to get a little bit dirty. Um, you're allowed for things to happen, and things happen in the lab. And one of the great things about labs, and very sophisticated labs, and we think about some of the best labs in the world, our scientists are playing every day. They're, they're experimenting with new different types of chemicals, and they, through their play, they get to spark the imagination, and their brain really like gets to go where it goes. And because it gets to do that, they are able to help with diseases and 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 really solve issues. Because the lab in itself is it's a playground. Um, it has different instruments. It has little co colorful. And you get really excited by these things. You even get to dress up. You get to put goggles on, safety goggles. And so um, it is a very high intelligence of play. And now you see a lot of new trends that are coming out to support play. And one of these that I think is really great is maker spaces. And a lot of times they'll have like building robots and robotics. And all of these things are, are now being popular. And the reason why they're popular is because um, of the STEM movement. Um, and that's where science, technology, English, and math, where we're trying to find, we're trying to develop more students who will be interested in math and science. Um, right now, because we have them do math and science a lot with books, then they're not able to really see the incredible um, type of learning you can do with it. Science is one of my favorite subjects. And um, I used to teach at the Hunt and Dawn Science Museum. And we did fun experiments every single day. We were always doing um, research, observations. And, and the kids were very, very curious. I can definitely say they lost curious. And then the other trend I was talking about, which is Genius Hour. And that's where, that's where teachers allow their students um, 20% of the time, or maybe like an hour a week, um, they allow them to just experiment and, and pursue their passion, that they can study whatever they want during that time. And this is why I think that play 
is the highest form of intelligence um, because it is when we play that we're able to really test our, our where our brain will go. In other words, if we give our students the opportunity, even if it's once a week and we say, okay, you have free play. What is free play? I'm not going to stop you. If it's not going to hurt you, then I'm not going to stop the process of your play. So we, we have to make an environment where they're able to play. And I showed a d different types of um, learning playgrounds that you could, you could um, have in your school. The library is sort of like that as well. Um, but you need more tools. And the important part, if you have a lab, anything like that, it's a great learning opportunity. But we can't be so strict with students. Um, and, and then the sad part is that a lot of labs now, students go in and they're only allowed to experiment and, and do lessons and exploring that the teacher has mandated. But if we could even give them 15 minutes, 30 minutes, um, or, you know, allow them to really experiment and, of course, do it with teaching them. Uh, they have to know what the different chemicals and stuff. But there's so much possibility. There's so many inventions and ideas and um, paths that they could explore. The other great thing about play is this also gives them the opportunity to test what we know. And, and that goes for us as well, because play isn't limited to just the kids. It's how far we can go. Um, so for example, if, you're, uh, if you really love cooking, then a lot of times you'll experiment and, and you'll add things. And sometimes it's going to be good and sometimes it's going to be bad. But during the process, you get to learn more about yourself. You, you test your limits. And then you also get to feel very proud of yourself because those times when you do discover something great or you do something great in the midst of play is when you, you really can, can see how far, if you take your imagination, what happens. Um, I think testing and drilling and all these things is, is good for maybe uh, very little of the curriculum, like maybe 10% or 5%. But I think the most enriching thing, and, and the one that we've taken out of the curriculum, is, is the playing part. So hopefully you got some ideas, and hopefully you can think of ways for your topic or your subject, whatever you teach, um, how to get your students to play, how to get them to move around, how to get them to really just use their imagination and test different things, experiment, discover. Even if, the res even if there is no result, even if they don't get a grade for it. Um, and one of the presenters was presenting today, actually quite a few, and they were talking about different aspects of play that they use with their students. And it was just amazing, the results. It, was, um, it really blew my mind. Uh, so hopefully you get to go to the Reform Symposium the rest of the week. We're having a free conference. And you can see many wonderful people present from all over the world. I'm going to end the recording because the